Many have asked us how to make financial donations to the church during this time that we are unable to meet together. There are two ways you are able to do so. One is by going to our website at www.kadorishchurch.org and then clicking on the Give tab. There, you can click on another link for online giving. Also, you are welcome to send your tithes and offerings in the mail to the church as well. You can place your gift in your offering envelope and then in another envelope with our church address on it at Kadorish Church of the Brethren, 1129 Dunkard Valley Road, Dallas Town, Pennsylvania, 17313. Your contribution will be deposited promptly. We hope this is useful information, as many have asked us about how to do it. We thank you for your donation, and we pray for it to work in big ways for the glory of God. Good morning. We welcome you to another version of our Kadoris mobile service a virtual service as we exist during these COVID times. We didn't expect it to go this long, but we're taking what the Lord gives us and we're working with that as we go. Some of you may have been wondering, and I know some of you have been wondering, when we might meet in person again. Well, we are working on that. We had a couple of meetings last week and this week, the leadership team will meet and we hopefully will have a date so you know soon when it will be but we're doing the best we can to serve everyone as best we can in the most healthy way we can. So please bear with us as we have these discussions and make these decisions, which are really difficult to make during these times. But we thank you for tuning in this morning. Today, we're going to start a new series. It is entitled, David, Profile of a King. David is the second king of Israel. And David had some humble beginnings, as we'll get into and learn about him. In fact, David was an unexpected candidate to be king, to be, in fact, Israel and Judah's best king that ever was, the most God-honoring king of all the kings, even with the mistakes that David made. Despite David's mistakes, David is still described as, by God, 
as a man after God's own heart. And so we'll see how King David's family line is still ruling today. David's reign goes from 1 Samuel the whole way to 1 Kings. And it's an incredible account of David's life. And we'll just be scratching the surface as we get into this. There's so much more that I encourage you to read at home. You know, in my life, sometimes the unexpected has taken place. As I was growing up, I never expected that I would one day leave Pennsylvania and live in Indiana because I never expected my dad would end up becoming a pastor. I just listened recently to my brothers and my, my uh, our quartet music album. It's kind of entertaining to listen to every once in a while because it brings back some memories. And in the first album we recorded, we kind of had a little bit of an embarrassing talking section at the end of the CD. And it's amazing for me to think about because that was recorded in 2002. And here we are 18 years later. I was just getting ready to start my senior year of college. And you know, as I think about it, it doesn't seem like that much time has passed. I mean, in some ways I feel like I'm still at that same age in my life, but 18 years has taken place. I never imagined, I never expected I'd be working in construction. I never imagined I would move back to Pennsylvania. I didn't know or expect that I would be a pastor here at Cadoris Church. I never thought I would work at the butcher shop for seven years when I moved back. All of that was completely unexpected in my life. You know, we had no idea 18 years ago that this crazy virus would exist in 2020. What unexpected things have happened in your life? What things have taken place that you simply weren't planning on taking place? And as you look back, what things have happened in your life that have just simply blown your mind? While surprises and unexpected things happen in our lives, for God, he wasn't surprised. God expects the unexpected. In fact, there's really no such thing as something that was unexpected for God because he knows it's coming. As David's rise to being in this position that God is calling, to, calling him to takes place, we will see the unexpected being the plan that God ordained. Let's pray. Father God, I pray you would lead me today as I preach these words. Lord, I pray that these words would please you and inspire our hearts to live for you. Lord, we thank you for your recorded word and how King David rose to being the king from his humble beginnings. Lord, may the unexpected be in your plan all along. Inspire us during these unexpected times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 16 today, and that is 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 13. To, get, to catch you up on what has been going on in the life of Israel during this time, Israel didn't always have a king. In fact, that really wasn't how God laid out his plan for Israel. He, he didn't really, wasn't really planning on them having kings. Of course, he knew it would happen, but it wasn't really his original plan. But you see, other nations had kings, and Israel just begged God for a king because they wanted to be like the other nations. God warned them through the prophet Samuel that this could end up being a bad thing for them, but they didn't care. First, in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel warns them in verses 11 through 18 that kings will take these things from them. Samuel says, if you have a king, this is what a king's going to take away from you. He's going to take away your sons for military service. He's going to use them for, as farm workers and to make weapons. He's going to take your daughters away, and they're going to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He's going to take away the best of your fields 
He's going to take away the best of your vineyards, the best of your olive groves. He's going to take a tenth of your grain. He's going to take the best of your flocks. He's going to take your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys. That a king would take all of this stuff away from them. In fact, he says, you'll end up being the king's slaves. You'll cry out for relief and the Lord will not answer you. I mean, that doesn't sound very good, right? But the people were dead set on having a king. And this is what they said in 1 Samuel 8, verses 19 through 22. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. So Samuel anoints Saul as Israel's first king. And it did not take long for Saul to mess things up and for Saul to disobey the Lord. And we see as we read the book of 1 Samuel that disobeying the Lord is a pattern in Saul's life. I mean, it's a whole other sermon, all the times that Saul disobeyed the Lord. In one particular time, Saul did not wait for Samuel, as Samuel asked him to, to do this burnt offering. In 1 Samuel 13, 13, Samuel says to him, Saul, you've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you, and if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So who is that man? Well, we're going to find out soon that it's David, the shepherd. But 1 Samuel 13.13 Samuel 13 is the first reference to David. Samuel did not know yet who this was going to be. In 1 Samuel 15, upon further direct disobedience of the Lord from King Saul and a heart that's not surrendered to God, Samuel informs Saul that God has rejected him as king. And this was painful for Samuel because it just hurts him that his people are putting themselves through this. Samuel anointed Saul as Israel's first king. And here now he's rejected by God. And Samuel hurts for Saul. And Samuel hurts for the Israelites as well. In fact, in chapter 1535, it says this then, how Samuel responded to this final, not final, but this kind of putting the straw that broke the camel's back for the Lord and for Samuel about Saul. It says, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So we see that Samuel's mourning for Saul. He hates that Saul just can't seem to follow the Lord. And the Lord regrets making him king. What a regret. But God had someone after his own heart in mind for this position. So that brings us to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. This passage starts out with God kind of lifting Samuel up. You know, he's like, Samuel, this thing didn't work out, but now it's time to move on. I've already chosen the next king. In fact, other, other versions of this text and the Hebrew itself, God actually says, I've chosen a king for myself. I've chosen my king which is interesting how it's worded here because when they refer to Saul in the other passages, like in the choosing of Saul, in chapter 8, verse 18, chapter 8, verse 22, chapter 12, verse 13, all of that, all of those references say their king. It was Israel's king. But here we see that this, 
this next person, God's anointing, would be God's king. Samuel was not expecting the rejection of Saul. I mean, chapter 8, verse 6 shows Samuel being displeased as Israel's desire to have a king, first off. And now God gives them the king and is not working out. All of this did not sit well with Samuel. But God got Samuel ready because a better king was coming. And God told him to take his horn with oil that would be used for anointing the new king. And God was just going to point out to Samuel who this next person would be. He would anoint him on this journey to, be, to fulfill God's calling to be the king. Now you might wonder who this Jesse is. Well, we first read about Jesse in the book of Ruth. There was a woman named Naomi who had a husband and two sons. And tragically, her husband and two sons both died. But her sons were married, and so they had, she had, daughters-in-law. One of those daughters-in-law was Ruth. And Ruth went with Naomi back to her homeland, back to Israel, and eventually ended up getting married and had some children. Well, Jesse is actually Ruth's grandson. So Ruth's great-grandson, David, is soon going to be the next king of Israel. And maybe even more notable, Rahab, if you remember Rahab, who she was a prostitute who God used to help defeat Jericho. Um, that's way back in the Old Testament as well. You should check that out and read that. Um, she, um, she tied a scarlet thread, scarlet ribbon on her window so the Israelites would know which house to spare the people in. Uh, she helped the spies of Israel. Anyway, long story short, uh, Rahab, um, her great-great-grandson would be David. And it's just interesting to see this family line go along. And that takes us to verses 2 to 3. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. We start to see that the character of Saul is just totally ungodly. Because Samuel, this prophet and judge, I mean, this high up guy, uh, he's a direct servant for God. He's scared that Saul is going to kill him if Saul gets wind of David going to anoint the new king. As you read further in the book of 1 Samuel, you'll see that Saul has this obsession with being the king. And even if he sees God's plan as a threat to him, Saul still wants to take control of things. The root cause of this for Saul is simply selfishness. And as time goes on, we see this obsession. We see this selfishness. We see this jealousy more and more and more. God gives Samuel a good idea. He's like, well, just go down there and have a sacrifice. So Samuel's like, okay, I'll do that. And then all the suspicion will be gone. And all he needs to do then is to invite Jesse's sons to the sacrifice and follow the instructions of God. God would tell Samuel what to do and who to anoint. Now, the Lexham Bible Dictionary says that people in the Bible are often anointed in recognition of the Lord's divine calling upon their lives. The anointing was a physical recognition of their particular role or office, such as king, prophet, or priest. This was a divine call that was coming from the Lord upon one of Jesse's sons, and the Lord would give Samuel the instructions that he needed. So that takes us to verses 4 and 5. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Unlike Saul, Samuel obeys the Lord. The text says he did what the Lord said. And then we see here there's a little bit of fear in the elders of the town 
maybe you've had an experience, and I can speak for myself, when I was in school, and over the intercom it said, would Ben Godfrey please come to the office? You know what happened. All the other kids would say, ooh, like, what did you do? You're in trouble. Maybe when someone texts you or calls you and says, hey, I, I need to talk to you about something, you might, the, the first thought you might have is like, oh no, like, what did I do? Like, what's wrong? What's going on? For whatever reason, we just automatically think when something like this happens that we're in trouble. And maybe it is because we're born sinners, we're inherently guilty people, right? But here the elders tremble and they're thinking, are we in trouble? I mean, they know that Samuel is used as an instrument of God's judgment from time to time. So they're a little concerned. This unexpected visit could be something that's really bad. And it indicates that maybe sometimes in the past it had been. Or maybe they thought Saul sent Samuel to them to do some of his dirty work for them. So they asked simply, do you come in peace? And sure enough, yes indeed, Samuel comes in peace. And Samuel orders them to consecrate yourselves. And that consecrate word is something, it's a term that they use to, to separate yourself from unholy things. It often included washing your body and putting on new clothes that are not unclean. And Samuel gives a special invitation to Jesse and his sons to come to the sacrifice. But little did they know what this really was all about. This unexpected visit was leading to an unexpected anointing. Let's look at verses 6 through 7. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So everyone is consecrated. The sacrifice happens or it's happening, and Jesse's sons come before Samuel. Samuel gets his eyes on Eliab, the tallest, well, not the tallest necessarily, but the oldest of Jesse's sons. I mean, it's a no-brainer because this guy totally looks the part of a king. Uh, now, we're not exactly sure what he looked like, but he definitely had a good appearance because Samuel's like, this has got to be the guy. You know, maybe he was strong, had a nice six-pack or something. We know he was tall because the text says don't consider his height, all right? Now, remember, the Bible also says that Saul, the first king chosen for Israel, um, Saul was a head above everyone else. So Saul was a tall guy. So maybe Samuel's thinking, all right, this guy's tall. Maybe that's a requirement from the Lord to be king. You know, he's the firstborn. It just, it all makes sense. So Samuel thought for sure this was it. But God said, no, nope, this is not it. In fact, God tells him to not consider appearance or height. Those are not part of God's prerequisites for the next king. You see, God sees things a little bit differently, really, God sees things a lot differently than we do because God has x-ray vision. God is not worried about how much of a warrior or how impressive one's physique is. After all, time and time again throughout scripture when battles are taking place, the text properly says that God won the battle. God will win the battles. God is more interested in someone who will submit to him, someone who will follow his leading, someone who will follow his guidance, unlike Saul. Psalm 147, verses 10 through 11 say, His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, in those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Someone whose heart would chase God's heart, that is who God wants for this job. Because God can see inside the person. God can see the person's heart. God knew that this heart of Eliab 
was not the right heart for this job. It's amazing how much we look at and focus on outward appearance and how much more God cares about the hearts. Which do we get hung up on? How beautiful it is to see a heart submitted to God and how crucial for this role. So who else would appear in front of Samuel? Verses 8 through 11 say, Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Abinadab, God says, nope, to Shammah, mm, I don't think so. Seven, I can do seven, seven sons, seven of them, the Lord did not choose. By now, Jesse and his sons must have known what was going on, that God was searching for the next king. And it must have been an awkward moment for each of them as they approached. And Samuel shook his head, no. But while it was unexpected that none of these seven sons would be chosen, God knew because God will choose whom he chooses. God looked at seven hearts and those seven hearts were not the hearts that God was looking for. A little hint to the future in next week's sermon, we see some different hearts of Eliab, for instance, versus David when handling Goliath. But there's a problem because all of the sons are there. There's no more sons to go by him. So Samuel saw that there's no more standing there, and he knows that God didn't choose any of those seven. So he says, are there any more sons? And yeah, sure, there's one more. You know, he's the baby of the family. He's out there working for the family, probably doing what no one else wanted to do. Jesse didn't even have him be consecrated and come to the sacrifice. In fact, it was unexpected that they would go through these seven and still need the eighth. It was unexpected for the lowly shepherd to have a chance at being the Lord's anointed. But you know how it goes. Samuel refuses to move on with the service until this youngest son is with them. That takes us to verses 12 through 13. So he, referring to Samuel, sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah, which is where he was headed as this began. Samuel summons David from the flock. We don't read yet that his name is David, but we know it's David. David is in the middle of his job. We notice, too, that as far as outward appearance is concerned, David's a good-looking fella as well. He's ruddy, which is kind of like when your cheeks are like flush and red all the time. Um, some versions say he was glowing in health. Uh, he looked healthy. He looked fresh. He had a fine appearance, which some versions say he had beautiful eyes. And he was handsome the text says. This is how David looked to Samuel. This is how David looked to everyone. This is how, as far as outward appearance is concerned, he looked to God. But God saw his heart, and God knew this is the heart that I want. God says to Samuel, anoint him. He is the one. So finally, this eighth and final son of Jesse is the one, the unexpected shepherd, taking an unexpectedly needed role of the king. Samuel anoints him, and notice that the scriptures points out 
the scriptures point out that this anointing took place in the presence of his brothers. His brothers were there for this. They saw this happening, and, and they knew that God was choosing David and that God rejected or didn't choose all of them. Perhaps some jealousy would arise among the brothers, and we see a little bit of that later on, again, with that Goliath situation. Perhaps now they know that maybe their hearts need to grow a little closer to God. And in the days before the Holy Spirit was in everyone who has accepted Christ, in those days, um, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit was not on everyone like that. And, and here it says that the Spirit of the Lord went to David, which is a pretty awesome thought. Uh, but on the opposite end, in verse 14, the very next verse, we see that the Spirit of the Lord left King Saul. And even worse, an evil spirit began tormenting Saul. God made it abundantly clear he was done with Saul being the king for Israel. And David was the next man up. Although it would be a number of years before David actually assumed the throne, David was now anointed and he would be the next one there. And part of the reason it was a long period of time until David was king was because David let it be in God's hands. David wasn't going to go after Saul and kill him and take the throne. David wanted everything to take place the way God had ordained it. And, it's, and the fact that David was just at peace with that is reflective of the attitude of David's heart, his attitude towards God. David, the shepherd, would be the next king. How unexpected, but again, not unexpected to God. There's a long line of shepherd leaders among the Israelites. The Israelites, many, many of them were known as shepherds. You have Joseph, who actually was a shepherd before his rise to being second in command of all of Egypt. You have David here. Jesus compares himself to the great shepherd, the good shepherd. And you know who the first were to hear of Christ's birth actually having taken place? Well, it was a group of shepherds out in the pastures, out among their flocks, just like David was when he was anointed king. So this trend continues, and David does not let this power go to his head, because the following verses show us that David goes back to the sheep. David gets back to work just as he was doing before. David was doing what his calling was and letting the Lord take care of the details. Saul, meanwhile, becomes tormented by this evil spirit and he wants someone to play music for him. And it just so turns out that another talent of David's is playing the lyre. And attendants of Saul knew this and they thought that maybe some soothing mu music would help Saul. So they sent for David. Little did Saul know that his placement, his replacement, was playing soothing music to help him out. And the evil spirit would leave when David would come and play the music. Saul liked David, and he actually made him as one of his armor bearers. All of this was unexpected, but not to God. So as we look at how to apply this word to our lives today, let's consider a couple of questions. What hasn't worked out in your life? It was unexpected to Samuel that the whole Saul King experiment didn't work out, and it did not sit well with Samuel. Samuel was frustrated, he was upset at the whole, the whole scenario. What in your life has been similar that has just frustrated you because it didn't work out the way it was supposed to? Maybe it's been canceled vacation plans for this summer. Maybe it's your graduation getting all messed up. Maybe it's classes being not the way you expected them or being stuck at home or having to have someone else do your grocery shopping for you. Maybe it's been health problems. Maybe it's just COVID-19 in general. I mean, 2020 has been a mean year, hasn't it? Are you praying 
and listening to God to see how he will use the unexpected in your life. The second thought and question I want to ask is, do you live in obedience to the Lord? Samuel obeyed the Lord by heading to Bethlehem with the horn filled with oil to anoint the next king. In listening to God and listening to his call, are you obeying what God may be calling you to do in your life? Are you living in obedience in every area of your life? life ends up just going so much better for us when we do. The third question I want to ask you is, do you have an inward focus or an outward focus in your life? Are you more worried and concerned about your outward appearance or your inward reality? 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Which do you worry about? I mean, for a while there, I let my hair go straight down. Uh, but in more recent times, I've been combing my hair to the side. And I have to be honest with you, when I try to comb my hair, I try to make sure every piece is in place and that none of it's messed up. And of course, you know, I want to lose some weight so I look better. And I'm worried about those things. Do we care more about that? While God is looking at our hearts, he knows us so well. And we so often don't do anything to help clean up the heart, but we take so much care of our outward appearance. Psalm 139, 1 through 4, talks about how much or how well God knows us and how much he just knows everything about us. Psalm 139, 1 through 4 says, You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Let's focus on our hearts and not be so concerned about this outward appearance and submit those hearts to God. Finally, I want to ask you, are you living God's call and not forcing that call? David knew that he had been anointed as king. His brothers knew it. His father knew it. Perhaps some of the elders of the town knew it. But David went back to the sheep, and he let God take care of the rest. We're going to see, as we go through this series, Saul's character versus David's character. Whereas David insists on letting the Lord take care of things the way the Lord wants to take care of things. And to compare it to Saul, he is obsessed with controlling as much of his life as he possibly can. Listen for God's call and live in that call and watch God work in your life. As we continue this series, may we learn from King David. May we be inspired by the humble beginnings that King David had and how he turned out to be Israel and Judah's best king. We'll see him go through some ups and downs for sure, but overall, David wanted what God wanted. David was not perfect but he chased after God's own heart. God used the unexpected for his glory, and God continues using unexpected things for his glory, including COVID-19. Let's keep our eyes open for how else God will do that today. Let's pray. God, again, we give our lives, we give our hearts to you. We thank you for your holy word that's been preserved for us to preach from, for us to read at home, for us to listen to. God, it's incredible to have your word in our lives. Lord, may we know and understand that as we live our lives, unexpected things are certainly going to come. But Lord, may we also know and trust that they're not unexpected to you and that you will use them for your glory. 
no matter how much we try to mess things up. Thank you, God, for our lives. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as a baby. I mean, that was unexpected, except for what the prophets said. But a king as a baby, I mean, how unexpected. Thank you for making a way for sinners like us to be with you forever. Thank you for your rise of David to king. May we learn from him and may we continually grow in Jesus each day. In his name we pray, amen. Yeah.